Yeah. Okay. So the um, the um, example today really is this, as you can see in your uh, yeah in your um, in your book in front of you, as you can see on my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah very good. Now, um, this is the example uh, of a really lovely example of um, Native American literature, which is very simple, very natural, very romantic, and very, really, even realistic, to be honest, is, is I thought, very much realistic in every sense. And here I chose for you this woman writer, uh, her name in the uh, Indian sort of native uh, name is, you know, her name is, as you can see, Zitkala Sa, or I don't know how, if, if I, if I, uh, I'm, if, if I'm, I'm not sure really the correct translation of this, but she calls herself even the English American uh, Western name, she calls her, herself Gertrude Simmons Bunin, um, Zitkala Sa. And as you can see, born uh, 1876, died 1938. And really here, I, I have um, got this from the net. As usual, most of the material really here I have for you, as you may have noticed so far, you know, and now we are nearing, nearing the end of the term. Most of the stuff, uh, you know, is internet, common common really free material um, no really sort of copyright uh, involved anyway so this example is um, uh, you know we have a collection of short stories i don't know uh, if you have uh, the time of you had i don't know did you did you look at any of these stories have you read any of these huh No, doctor, this is the first time for me. Oh, yeah. It's really, uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, people are writing in the chat. No, 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 not yet. Okay, I understand. I understand. Yeah, Sarah said, I did. Oh, I did not. <laughs> okay. So, really, the stories here, as I said, uh, they are really lovely and they are easy and the simple language. And the childish sort of like, you know, like um, similar to this, you know, mythological, maybe, uh, maybe if you like, could be like uh, maybe the Disneyland uh, sort of fairy tales. Really like, like those, maybe to some extent, fairy tale stories. And here I gave you a little, a little tiny introduction, as you can see. Here I got this from that. I give this a little uh, biographical information. As you can see here, I think you can read that on your own because, you know, this is uh, this is uh, clear. I'm sure you can uh, you can see that. So the stories here, um, um, as you can see, we have so many so many. Uh, really stories. I have selected for you some of this, even the title called American Indian Stories Selections. You know, this is the original title of the book. Uh, she calls this uh, American Indian Stories. And uh, the first uh, part or one section of this part is called Impressions of an Indian Childhood. And here I gave you, if I go quickly here, I can show you these short stories, the first one called My Mother, you know, My Mother, the second one called The Legends, and the third here I included called The um, um, Bed, uh, or sorry, well, I don't know, it's The Beadwork from The Beatles or Beadwork, and um, the next one is called The Coffee Making, and another short story called The Dead Man's Plum Bush. And uh, what else? Uh, number six, the, um, the Ground Squirrel. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I will leave this for you to choose the big red apples. Again, really, this is, uh, uh, as you can see here, there's lovely, um, if you like, uh, reference to the Bible. And this is, I say here, compare Genesis. Because this is something, if you like, similar to biblical, um, biblical references here. So really, I want to, again, here you can see, for example, uh, a story from the school days of an Indian girl. Again here, um, and uh, the first section, as you can see, childhood, here from the school days, meaning when she became, when she, for, so for example here, when this girl became a bit uh, young lady or the school time, I don't know, uh, the age could be from 9, 10 till I don't know when. Um, so here you can see again, a uh, really lovely story. Uh, again here, um, the story called The Cutting of My Long Hair. And I think this could be the last story, I think. Um, and uh, really all of them, all of them, they are really very easy, very simple, very emotional, and very natural. And, you know, you love those stories. You know, you can see here, I gave you a collection of those. Um, maybe I will, uh, actually, I have not yet, um, if you like, um, um, well, let me see. Um, I really don't know. I have. Uh, I thought I will give you. Um, maybe I should start with the first one because really it's it's uh, a very a very lovely uh, short story here about when she says about my mother. You know, again, as you can see, the stories most of them most of them. Um, as you can see, uh, as I said, very straightforward and easy. And here the narrator most of the time is using sometimes, you know, first person narration. narration. Notice here, a big, a, sorry, a wigwam of weather stained canvas stood at the base of some irregularly ascending hills. A footpath wound its way gently down the sloping land till it reached the broad river bottom. Creeping through the long swamp grasses that bent over it on either side, it came out on the edge of the Missouri. Here, morning, soon, and evening, my mother came to draw water from the muddy stream for our house household use. I mean, Look at the lovely language and the remember this is written originally as you can see it's written in English it's not written in any other language and this is not a translation it's written by this woman uh, Zetkala Sol or Zetkata Sa or I call her Gertrude Bonin Gertrude Bonin uh, she's using as I said really this is a lovely sort of uh, narrative and there's a lot of romantic look at the Look at the, um, you know, the um, description here, very romantic uh, beginning of the story. You know, the hills and the nature, as you can see, uh, notice the footpath wound its way, you know, the way, the moving of this, lo of this road here, you know, wounding its way. It's, it's not wound, we say wound here as a verb. Wound its way gently down the sloping land till it reached the broad river bottom. Creeping through the long swamp grasses that bent over it and either side, on either side, it came out on the edge of the Missouri. I love this, you know, the, the, the natural, you know, lovely language, the romantic, really, language here. You can see the childish, remember the story here. As you can see, impressions, impressions of an old, uh, you know, story, or as you can see from a child, you know, an Indian child reflecting about how she saw reality and how she saw life. So here you have a narration uh, narrated by a young girl, a young girl, really a small sort of 
a child girl telling us about her own life, about her impression, about the life she leads as an Indian, as an Indian uh, girl. Remember, this is to do with all the Indian native American, uh, you know, surroundings. It's like it's like those uh, maybe similar to those very natural black African uh, American stories of the slaves sometimes been mentioned or sometimes been narrated in a nostalgic way, could be sometimes in really dramatic, sometimes melancholic, sometimes sad, sometimes miserable and so on. But in the, in the general mood, you can see the romance. I think it's being said in nostalgic, romantic way. And I'd really, I'd really like you to look at this in a very lovely, positive, positive, romantic fashion, and very natural. Here, morning, soon, and evening, you can see here, oh, sorry, no, not soon. <laughs> see here, uh, you know, the repetition, that the work here is done monotonously. You know, the monotony about it every single day, she said, in mornings, noons, and evenings, my mother came to draw water from the muddy stream of our household use. Again, look at the word muddy stream. Of course, it's, it's natural water. And the bed, the bed of the water or the bed, uh, the river bed or the stream bed is, is of course mud, is muddy. It doesn't mean it's dirty. It doesn't mean it's dirty. It could be very clean and absolutely clean and even the best water, believe it or not. But sometimes if you touch this maybe stream, then it becomes murky and you can't drink it because it becomes murky and maybe dirty as a result of, you know, wallowing in it. Always when my mother started for the river, I stopped my play to run along with her. She was only of medium height. You know, look how she describes her mother, only, only of medium height. Often she was sad and silent, at which times her full arched lips were compressed into hard and bitter lines, and shadows fell under her black eyes. Then I clung to her hand and begged to know what made her tears fall. You see, look at the reaction. The baby is looking at her mom, and her mom sometimes, you know, she's saying she's sad, and look how she describes her face. When she's saying, I don't know why my mother is sad and silent, and maybe is, as you know, she's, he say, she's saying, compressed into hard lines and bitter, again, bitter lines, meaning, meaning the life that my mother led the life we lead is miserable life. We are poor. We have, we have to work hard to earn our living. And that's why I said black eyes. Of course, you know, the color here. It's not, it's not the thing to do with being black or white or something. Um, again, it's here for her. Really, it's a sign of beauty. It's nothing to do with being unhappy or for anything. It's the sign of the symbolism of absolute beauty here. Hush, my little daughter, must never talk about my tears. Look here, the mother said, Shh, you know, as if to say, Shh, my daughter, don't say anything about my tears. And smiling through them, she patted my head and said, now let me see how fast you can run today. I mean, I think this is lovely. You know, sometimes parents, the way they treat their kids, you know, as if they want to train them to run. And I've seen, really, I see people, I've done this myself, to be honest. I've done that many times with my kids, you know, to train them to run with them as if, you know, in a sports uh, sort of sportive manner. Now, let me see how fast you can run today. Whereupon I tore away at my highest possible speed with my long black hair blowing in the breeze. Look again the romanticism, how she's describing the way she's running and the hair, 
you know, is, as she said, blowing into, you know, the, into my hair, you know, in the breeze. Again, look at the romanticism. It's an absolutely lovely romantic way. I was a little girl of seven. Look at this. So our narrator is only seven years old. A lovely, absolutely lovely narrative. Loosely clad in a slip of brown bus, uh, buck skin. You no, know, here she's, the way she's describing what she's dressed here. Clad means dressed. You know, she's talking about her, her dresses. And buck skin, buck, you know, this kind of animal, you know, when we say Starbucks, you know, bucks really is one of those, like cow, sort of cow looking animal. Uh, you know, it's typical American, American, uh, you know, um, animal. It's like, um, it's like buffaloes or like buffaloes or cows or wild cows. I don't know. I mean, it's called, they call them bucks. And, um, um, and here she's saying, I was dressed like in a buckskin, brown buckskin, and light-footed with a pair of soft um, moccasins on my feet. I was as free as the wind that blew my hair, and no less spirited than a bounding deer. Look at the images, you know, she's using all these wildlife images, the bucks, and the, you know, she said here again, um, you know, um, she said the um, spirited deer, you know, again, comparing herself to a deer, like a gazelle. And, um, uh, you know, um, in, in really a lovely uh, fashion, the way she's using all those natural, absolutely natural, realistic, and as I said, romantic, absolutely lovely romantic, narrative here. Notice, there, these were my mother's pride, meaning my hair is my mother's pride. And yes, I think we love, especially mothers, they look at their daughters when they are growing, you know, when they are like this age, seven, nine, ten, eh, eleven, you know, etc. They look at their hair and they, you know, they wait for their hair to grow, to become long hair, you know. And it's really lovely, the lovely feeling. She said, my mother, you know, the pride of my mother is, is my hair. My wild freedom, my wild freedom and overflowing spirits. She taught me no fear, save that of intruding myself upon others. Look again here, the lovely, the lovely way she's been brought up. Not to fear anything, but only one thing she said, she taught me not to intrude into people's business. Not to intrude, and I think this is a lovely thing. Not to intrude, and I think intruders are ugly. We don't like to intrude into people's business and stick our noses in people's affairs. And I think this is terrible. Sometimes people in any society, I think this is, this is true. So notice here, you can see the narrative, the simple, Look at the small paragraphs, the easy language, the simple language. Lovely language, isn't it? Very simple. Even you can see it's narrated by a young lady. Even the language of this, it's a young lady, seven years old. Having gone many paces ahead, I stopped, panting for breath and laughing with glee as my mother watched my every moment movement. I was not wholly conscious of myself but was more keenly alive to the fire within. Notice, it's like poetry. I think it's like poetry. Huh? Aja. Aja. Oh, you can't speak? You can't speak? Um. I'm here. Who's speaking? I'm looking at the names to check who's speaking. Who's this? It's Hajar. Did you call my name? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hajar, yeah. Yeah. 
Do we have another Hajar here? No, you are the only one. Yeah. I mean, look at this. I'm saying, do you agree with me? It looks like it looks like poetry, isn't it? What do you think? I think so. Absolutely. Doctor. Yeah. I think I think this this lovely language uh, reflects uh, the author's uh, purity or the author's pure uh, heart actually toward the life she she lived absolutely yeah the purity the innocence the romanticism the naturalism the spontaneity the the real lovely natural remember remember these people um uh, these people really they lived in a pure lovely fashion with their own uh, you know, uh, natural houses, the surroundings, and all this. And I think, as I said, this is the beauty of 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 everything to do with with uh, Native American literature. It's lovely, really lovely, and beautiful, and romantic. As I said, this to me looks like absolutely looks like like uh, uh, really. Um, what? Um, Messages from um, Hayat Data and the uh, Dominoes and for God's sake and NBOs. Yeah. They send a lot of messages and I don't care about them. Anyway, um, notice what she said keenly alive to the fire within. You know, the real life, the absolute beauty, and you know, notice alive and the fire being very very happy i was as if i were the activity uh, sorry it was as if i were the activity and my hands and feet were only experiments for my spirit to work upon you know again you know as i said this is really this is really very good returning from the river i tucked beside my mother with my hand upon the bucket, I believed I was carrying. One time on such a return, I remember a bit of conversation we had. My grown-up cousin, um, Warka Ziwin, I think this is funny, isn't it? Warka? Warka Ziwin? And I think she's, this is look like Arabic, Warka? Warka Ziwin, huh? isn't it? Sunflower? Is this Arabic, Warqa? Warqa? Do we have any Warqa? No. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lovely, a lovely word. This could be Arabic origin, I don't know. Warqa Zewin, her cousin, right, who was then 17, always went to the river alone for water for her mother. Their wigwam was not far from ours. And I saw her daily going to and fro, um, uh, sorry, to and to and from the river. I admired my cousin greatly. So I said, Mother, when am I, when I am tall as my cousin Warkaziwi, you shall not have to come for water. I will do it for you. You know, this is lovely, isn't it? You see, when I grow up, I become as old as Warka, as Warka, Warkaziwi. Uh, I will come, I will do the work for you. With a strange tremor in her voice, which I could not understand, she answered, if the pale face does not take away from us the river we drink. Ah, yeah, who is this here, Ismail? Are you Ismail here or who? My friend, hello. No one, Doctor Ismail. The, the Who are you? Uthman, Uthman. Uthman, أنت التي تحدثت من قبل. Uthman. نعم إنني أنا. Very good. Yes, my good friend, Uthman. Yeah. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. 
Thank you, and sorry for speaking in Arabic, but I liked it the way, you know, it's like um, <laughs> jokingly. Yeah, Osman, can you can you tell me um, uh, what is if the pale face does not take away from us the river? What does she mean here? Doctor, uh, she means or she meant the, Euro the Europeans who stole they are they are lands who stole their souls who stole their parents and children. Very good. You are my Osman. Why she says pale, pale face? Because they pale. are white. Because they are white. Why didn't she say white? Because they're they are brown and the americans are white so the difference between the colors maybe there's why, why? no 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 there is politics here in the word pale face there is politics isn't it there is ideology here there is politics because Rothman, maybe, yeah yeah maybe because whites are very proud of themselves so they see whiteness as a bad thing i mean the native americans very good because she, they hate them that's why they say the wheel the pale face not the white face the ugly face the terrible face the ugly face the ugly face really here the pale face she means the ugly american the ugly white Yankees, the ugly white men who came and took from us everything. If, she said, they don't take. Notice here the politics, isn't it? The real racism, the anger, the anger, the real anger. Because when she said the pale face, the ugly white men who came and took everything from us. So this is really the racism. The absolute racism, that the way they suffer from racism. Yeah, meaning, notice, notice what she said. Mother, who is this bad pale face, I asked. Mm. My little daughter, he is a sham. He is a sham, a sickly sham. The bronze Dakota is the only real man. Wow. <clears throat> you know the word sham? And really, this is funny. I don't know. Osman. The first time, doctor, I hear it. Sham. I, I sham means false. Means false. Means double face means trouble face, means four face, means wicked, means munafiq, means kazab. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the savages, the aggressive savages who who went to that Exactly, land. the aggressive, the rest. And you know, you know I, I laugh about the word sham here. You know? To be honest, to, and maybe maybe I'll tell you a little story here. Really, in Syria, in Syria, we in Syria we believe that the people because we call we use the word sham to mean Damascus. In Syria, the word sham, maybe for you the word sham means Syria, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. It's called a sham. And is the word sham here related to a sham? Maybe do you think? It's funny to say this. It's funny, really. I'm I'm from a sham myself. I am Syrian myself, and I'm saying this to you really honestly. And this is a real story. Really, we people in Syria who live outside Damascus, they call the Damascene people as being wicked and false people. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, honestly. Do you know any sham person? Doctor, what? Yeah? Doctor, 
Yeah. What do you mean by Damascenian people or whatever? Damascene, people of the he Damascus. said. Sorry? Oh, yes. Yes, I got it. The people who live in Damascus, like Muscat, the city is called Damascus, and the adjective is Damascene. The adjective of Damascus is Damascene, right? And people in Aleppo, in Homs, in other places in Syria, in a joking way, in a joking way, we say the people in Damascus are mostly, are mostly, mostly, I'm not saying all of them. And this is a joke, by the way, it's not, maybe people, if anybody here is from, from Damascus will be angry with me, but I don't care, because that's what they say. You know, they are sometimes double-faced people, and that's why, wow, wow. So I don't know, the word sham in English means, means double-faced, means wicked, means false, means not real, means hypocrite, means whatever. So that's why here she's saying to her, well, my daughter, these people are sham people, are wicked, are ugly, are false, are blah, blah, blah. And that's why she said not real. And she said the bronze Dakota, one of those, you know, figures, and she means us, the people, the brown people, us. And she said the bronze means the brown, we the brown, because the red Indians, normally they look like the color is the bronze color, you know, bronzage, as we say, you know. And when you get tanned by the sun, right? And she said, we are the only real ones, whereas these people are sham, are false, are wicked, are hypocrites. I looked up into my mother's face while she spoke, and seeing her bite her lips, I knew she was unhappy. This aroused revenge in my small soul. Look at this, revenge. Can you imagine a baby of seven-year-old girl looking at her mother being unhappy and the young girl here, seven years old, feeling that she wants to take revenge for her mother? Can you believe it? Can you feel the feeling? You know, really, notice, stamping my foot on the earth, I cried aloud, I hate the pale face that my mother that makes my mother cry. Wow, isn't it? I hate the pale face that makes my mother cry. I hate those Yankees who kill us. I hate those white men who stole everything from us. Everything, I hate them. And look at the childish, really amazing thing when she said, I hate the pale face, the pale face. The wee al-wujuh al-shahiba. Huh? Al-wujuh al-ghabara, really, if you like, I don't know. <laughs> you understand? Really, it's, it's an amazing thing here. So notice here, you can see the politics in the story. So it's not just romantic and childish and simple, but there is a lot of ideology, a lot of politics involved. The absolute anger against the white man. Setting the pail of water on the ground, my mother stopped and stretching her left hand out on the level with my eyes, she placed her other arm about me. She pointed to the hill where my uncle and my only sister lay buried. Again, look at the lovely melancholic sad scene. She's saying, look here, your uncle and your sister, where they were buried, they were killed or dead. Notice, there, there, is what the pale face has done. Since then, your father too has been buried in a hill nearer the rising sun. We were once very happy, but the pale face has stolen our lands 
and driven us hither, having defrauded us of our land, their pale face forced us away. You see, this is it. Absolutely. She said, we were taken away, we were driven away, we were killed, our, our kids, our land, everything is stolen from us. And you can see that, it's very clear. I think I don't need to explain this, it's very clear. Well, it happened on the way we moved camp that your sister and uncle were both very sick. Many others were ailing, but there seemed to be no help. We traveled many days and nights, not in the grand, happy way that we moved. I don't know. I think we should. Uh, I think this sen this sentence should be here. Yeah, I think so. I don't know why. Yeah, I think it should be one paragraph. Please, please try to correct it because it's one paragraph. I'm sorry. Maybe I sent it to you without quickly looking at it. Okay, please try to correct it the way I did. Hmm to make it one paragraph. So here she's telling her how this happened. They were driven away in the middle of absolute, you know, horrible fashion at night, or, you know, you can see when we were forced from one camp to another. You see, many others were ailing, but there seemed to be no help. We traveled many days and nights, not in the grand happy way that we moved camp when I was a little girl, but we were driven, my child, driven like a herd of buffalo. We were driven. We were driven like, you know, driving cows or cattle in front of you. He said, like, like a herd of buffalo, with every step, your sister who was not as large as you are now, shrieked, with the pain jar until she was hoarse with crying. She grew more and more feverish. Her little hands and cheeks were burning hot. Her little lips were parched and dry, but she would not drink the water I gave her. Then I discovered that her throat was swollen and red. My poor child, how I cried with all with her, because the great spirit had forgotten us. Mm -hmm. Here the meaning, the great spirit, meaning for them God, or maybe one of their gods. But here really when you say great spirit in capital G and capital S, you know, she means, of course, the Holy Spirit, you know. And remember, these people were not Christians or were not, you know, if you like, uh, at that time, you know, uh, these people were were innocently sort of believers in somehow. I mean, look at the conclusion here. Look at the terrible, absolutely political, absolutely political message here. Said the way these innocent people were terribly, in an ugly way, killed in massive numbers. Remember, and this is real, by the way. This is real. More than 80 million people, more than 80 million people, more than 80 million native Red Indian native people were killed by the white man in America. Americans are the most criminal, if you like, really in terms of ideology. And Americans know it and they say, we did it. They say this. I've heard it many times by scholars and professors in America and in Britain. I've heard it by Naum Chomsky. And I, I, maybe if you like, I can send you the video to hear what he said. Naum Chomsky today, Noam Chomsky, who is the most famous man, the most famous man on earth now, the most famous man on earth now living is Naum Chomsky, the professor at Harvard University. Now, 
who is the father of linguistics and the father of so many other sciences, Naum Chomsky. He said it. I've heard it in my own ears and I've seen him in my own eyes in real life. He said it. More than 80 million people killed by us white Americans. And we are ugly because we did that. Yes. And this is not fiction. And I'm not angry to say this, but I'm sad to say this. Really. And all Americans, most, most innocent Americans, most innocent writers, most innocent good politicians, most good historians or whatever, they say this and they admit it. They say, well, we were ugly. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. At last, at last, when we reached this Western country, on the first war, weary night, your sister died. You know, she here, she's telling her how you, her sister died. And soon your uncle died also, leaving a widow and an orphan daughter. Your cousin Warqa, your cousin Warqa Ziwin. And I like to call her Warqa, really. It's a lovely name in Arabic, Warqa. I, we had, I had a colleague who, who was a doctor at university, Damascus University, called Warqa Barmada. She was a lovely doctor. And Warqa here, I don't know. I think she's an, the name is Arabic name. I don't know. Notice here that this Warqa Ziwin is the daughter of that man who died, who was killed by the white man, by the pale face. Both your sister and uncle, uncle might have been happy with us today had it not been, had it not been, Lawla. Lawla, had it not been for the heartless, pale, pale face. You see, very emotional. Yes. My mother was silent the rest of the way to our wigwam. Though I saw no tears in her eyes, I knew that was because I was, I was with her. She seldom, she seldom wept before me. Yeah, I love this, really. The legends, here I read this with you again. During the summer days, my mother built her fire in the shadow of our wigwam. You know, it's like here with the word wigwam could be like our cottage or like our small hut it's like a hut or like a cabin or a like you know she used the word here in the early morning our simple breakfast was spread upon the grass west of our tp at the farthest point of the shade my mother sat beside her fire toasting a savory piece of dried meat near her i sat upon my feet eating my dried meat with unleavened bread and drinking strong black coffee. Wow. <laughs> Again, you know, please, 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 my, my dear students, please read all these stories. They are lovely. Read all of them. Um, notice again the spontaneity and the lovely narrative. The morning meal was our quiet hour when we two were entirely alone. At noon, several who chanced to be passing by stopped to rest and to share our luncheon with us, for we were sure of our hospitality. And you know, this is true. People in the village, I remember this in our village when I was a young man myself. Really, when, when my mother used to... to uh, to do in in those days we used to do the, you know to make to bake bread um, outside you know we have this normal handmade handmade um, you know fireplaces to bake or bakeries or to bake bread and anybody who passes by we say 
come along and eat some bread because the bread will be absolutely, you know, hot and fresh and the smell of fresh bread, right? And we have this. I don't know. Do you say this? Yeah, Uthman, do you say this in, Ar in Arabic and Oman? Um, or we say the saying, ما بيضحك لرغيف السخن. Uh, I, the first time, doctor, I hear of that. We say, ما بيضحك ما بيضحك لرغيف السخن, which means if somebody who is always, you know, frowning and always angry, but if you give him a hot piece of bread, should smile, because we humans, we humans should smile to bread, because that's why it's, we call this ni'ma. And anybody should smile to a hot, to a hot. You don't see this, Oman, do you, girls? Have you ever heard of this? No, doctor. This is the first time. Well, we say this in Syria. We say the first time. So I'm teaching you English, American, and Syrian Arabic. Okay. So, yeah, we see. Okay, doctor. We, yeah. we, study, we are studying from you. Yeah, very good. We say, uh, we say, yeah, ما بيضحك للغيف السخن. يا أخي شبك. اضحك يا شيخ. وش صار فيك؟ ها؟ You know the idea. This is really, we say this. It's, it's really amazing. And that's why here she said, you know, the expression here, the question of hospitality. Hospitality hospitality and you know many societies today many societies maybe lost this hospitality and to be honest with you I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm honest about it I'm honest about it I have noticed here I lived in Saudi for 15 years nobody really I lived in Saudi for 15 years nobody nobody asked me home for dinner or lunch or anything. Nobody. I mean, no Saudi, I should say. No Saudi. Oh, doctor, how that, doctor? Maybe you were far oh, away I, from I, them. Oh, my well, Azim, I was, I was angry. I said, come on. Come on, people. <laughs> we always say Because, Qatar. doctor. We always so, say so it, We say, no, no, so no. Yes. I, have, I have not finished. Let me, let me finish. I have noticed, I have noticed here, many, many Omani people, friends in the university, doctors and professors, many of them in a real genuine fashion, they say, please, and they did, they did say, come to us. We want you to be with us. We invite you for dinner or for lunch. And you know, I was emotional. I was emotional. I said, oh, wow. This is lovely. Yeah, because in Syria, we ask people home. We ask people home. We say, Faddal, Faddal. And we mean it. We mean it. We don't just say it like that. It's amazing, isn't it? So the question of hospitality is natural. Villagers, villagers, villagers are very, if you like, hospitable because of the surrounding. Because the village, the people in the village, they know each other. They all know each other. And they invite each other. And I have noticed here the Omani society is very friendly. And they love to gather. And I have noticed here because of the corona thing, I have noticed even the government and the people saying that people, people, please stop gathering. Stop gathering because you are, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so the idea really is, is to me, is striking and is lovely. The question of hospitality here. And the idea, uh, you know, is, is stressed here to say that the white-faced, the pale-faced, the white Americans, uh, you know, they were ugly in, in so many ways, including this, that they were very, very, 
uh, you know, different from the Native Americans. And this is the idea about sitting outside, eating, and inviting anybody for their lunch, you know, for to share with them. My uncle, whose, whose death my mother was lamented, was one of our nation's bra bravest warriors. And here we come back, the story comes back to the idea of, you know, the uncle, what here to go, to go back to this, the question of politics. His name was on the lips of old men when talking of the proud feats, feats of valor, courage. And it was mentioned by, the, by younger men too, in connection with deeds of gallantry. You see, this is it, you know, going back here to compare the natives, how much they fought against the pale face. And all the time she uses the word pale face. They don't say white face because they, they are really, they call them, you know, in negative. And they deserve that, by the way, they deserve that. Notice, old women praised him for his kindness toward them. Young women held him up as an ideal at their sweet, as to their sweethearts. Everyone loved him, and my mother worshipped his memory. Thus it happened that even strangers were sure of welcome in our lodge, if they but asked a favor in my uncle's name. You see? So everybody, even strangers, they would be welcome. They would be welcome to our house. Only in the name of my uncle, they would be welcome. You see, notice here the, the exact idea of hospitality. And I think, you know, um, really it's lovely. I mean, there are so many good uh, ideas and themes here. Let me, let me read this. Though I heard many strange experiences related by these wayfarers, I loved best the evening meal. For that was the time old legends were told. You know, yeah, in the old days when there was no TV, of course, even I'm talking about my life, by the way. I'm talking about my life. And maybe if you ask your parents about their life, at that time, there was no electricity, no TVs, nothing. The whole family would sit and people will talk and tell stories and tell, you know, every evening they gather together and they, you know, the respect and the children will learn from their fathers and so on. And notice here, this is the idea. The evening meal was the lovely occasion. And when legends and stories were told, I was always glad when the sun hung low in the West. For when my mother sent me to invite the neighbor, the neighboring old men and women to eat supper with us, you see, look at this hospitality. Going to invite other neighbors. You know, just like that for no reason. You understand? Yeah. People today, nobody does that. Very, very, very rarely it happens. You know, when my mother sent me to invite the neighboring old men and women, to eat supper with us. Running all the way to the wigwams, I halted shyly at the entrances. Sometimes I stood long moments without saying a word. It was not any fear that made me do, do dumb, uh, so dumb, sorry, when out upon such a happy errand, nor was it that I wished to withhold the invitation, for it was all I could do to observe this very proper silence but it was a sensing of the atmosphere to assure myself that I should not hinder other plans. My mother used to say to me, as I was almost bounding away to the old people, wait a moment before you invite anyone. Wait a moment before you invite anyone. If other plans are being discussed, don't interfere, but go elsewhere. Wow, you see? Again, here we come back at the way these kids are brought up. Interfere, no intruders. Again, to go back to the intrusion. Meaning, before knocking at the door, listen a little bit. If you hear people saying are planning to do something, so don't go in. Go to another house and ask them to come for food. 
wait a moment before you invite anyone. If other plans are being discussed, do not interfere, but not elsewhere. Remember, this is not a bad habit. Sometimes we teach, we teach our kids, don't stand at doors and listen to at people. We say this to our kids, don't do that because here you can, because you will be, as we say, you are stealing or eavesdropping, as we say, eavesdropping. Don't listen to um, you know people's sort of. We say this to kids these days: don't stand at the door and listen. But here it doesn't mean in a bad sense. It means listen for two minutes, maybe for a moment, to see if there's a, a kind of discussion or if is your invitation will be an intrusion, then don't invite, go to somebody else. The old folks knew the meaning of my poses. Ah, you see, this is it. The, the old folks, the old people knew this idea. And often they coaxed my confidence by asking, why do you seek little granddaughter? Sorry, what do you seek, little granddaughter? Means what do you want? What you are searching for? My mother says you are to come to our TP this evening. I instantly exploded and breathed the freer afterwards. So you see, immediately send the, invita the invitation. Yes, yes, gladly, gladly, I shall come. Replied each reply. You know, they they in a very spontaneous way. Rising at once and carrying their blankets across one shoulder, they flocked leisurely from their various wigwams toward our dwelling. My mission done, I ran back, skipping and jumping with delight. All out of breath, I told my mother almost the exact words of the answers of my invitation. Frequently, she asked, what were they doing when you entered their TP? what they were doing, notice here, what were they doing when you entered their houses? This taught me to remember all I saw at a single glance. Often I told my mother my impressions without being questioned. While in the neighboring wigwam sometimes, an old Indian woman asked me, what is your mother doing? Unless my mother was cautioned me Sorry, unless my mother had cautioned me not to tell, I generally answered her questions without reserve. On at the arrival of our guests, I sat close to my mother and didn't leave her side without first asking her consent. I ate my supper in quiet, listening patiently to the talk of the old people, wishing all the time that they were be, they were that they would begin the stories I loved best. At last, when I could not wait any longer, I whispered in my mother's ear, ask them to tell, to tell an Iktumi story, mother. Iktumi story, mother. Soothing my impatience, my mother said aloud, my little daughter is anxious to hear your legends. By this time, all were through eating and the evening was fast deep, deepening into twilight. As each, of, as each in turn began to tell a legend, I pillowed my head in my mother's lap. Wow, look at this lovely verb here. Pillowed my head in my mother's lap, meaning I used my mother's lap as a pillow because the word pillow and look here, it's used as a verb. I pillowed, means I used my mother's lap as a pillow and I wanted to sleep in my mother's lap. And lying flat upon my back, I watched the stars as they peeped down upon me one by one. The increasing interest of the tale aroused me and I sat eagerly listening to every word. The old woman made me funny, made funny remarks and laughed so heartily that I could not help jo joining them. You know, it's really amazing. Maybe I could, I could finish this, and uh, please, I will leave this to you. The distant howling of a pack of wolves, 
or the hooting of an owl in the river bottom frightened me, and I nestled into my mother's lap. She added some dry sticks to the open fire, and the bright flames leaped up into the faces of the old folks as they sat around in a great circle. On such an evening, I remember the glare of the fire shone on a tattooed star upon the brow of the old warrior who was telling a story. Notice here again, you know, the tattoo star upon the brow, you know, they, they draw on their faces a lot, you know, these Indians. I watched him curiously as he made the unconscious gestures. The blue star upon his bronze forehead, notice here the color, the bronze color. You know, these people are always brown. Why, you know, light brown, light brown, a bit light brown, was a puzzle to me. Looking about, I saw two parallel lines on the chin <clears throat> of one of the old women. The rest had none. I examined my father's, my mother's face, but found no sign there. After the warrior's story was finished, I asked the old woman the meaning of the blue lines on her chin, looking all the while out of the corners of my eyes at the warrior with the star on his forehead. I was a little afraid that he would rebuke me for my boldness. Here the old woman began, why my grandchild, they are signs, secret signs, I dare not tell you. I shall, however, tell you a wonderful story about a woman who had a cross tattooed upon each of her cheeks. Wow. You know, again, really, please, I want you to think deeply about these sentences, really. I want you to look at the signs here. They are signs, secret signs. I will tell you these signs later, but not now. There are wonderful stories. I want you to tell you about this. You know, again, notice here the tattooing crosses uh, on her cheeks or whatever. All these are sim symbolical of all kinds of stories about their life, whether misery or happy or whatever. It was a long story of a woman whose magic power lay hidden behind the mask, the marks upon her face. I fell asleep before the story was completed. Ever after that night, I felt sup suspicious of tattooed people. Wherever I saw one, I glanced in furtively at the mark and drowned about it, <clears throat> wondering what terrible magic power was covered there. It was rarely that such a fearful story as this one was told by the campfire. Its impression was so acute that the picture still remains vividly, sorry, remains vividly clear and pronounced. Of course, you have to tell me what story. She didn't tell us, right? And she didn't say what are these signs and what are these secret signs, as she said there. There are, you know, of course, really you can give here, today here, you can give all, all kinds of paraphrasing or explanations of this. Please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finish all these stories, please because they are only, yeah, well, 15 pages. I'm sure you can do that. Please, maybe next time, if I have time, I will read another story. I will choose another one for you. But all these stories are included for you in the exam. Okay, because they are lovely and I want you to read them. Okay, any question? Uh, doctor, I have a question regarding to the term Beba. Yes. Uh, should we have uh, a specific uh, topic, for example, discussing one element, for example, symbols, uh, like for the story or the novel, or we are going to analyze all the novel, all the aspects? No, no. Thank you very much, Ya Anwar, for this. Thank you, Anwar. 
No, really, you have to use a prompt question. Like when, when we have, maybe you have learned in academic writing. If you have done academic writing, you need to put a prompt or like a question or like an argument. It's not a general, it's not general description of something. It's not general description of something. You have to ask yourself a question. Like here you can say, analyze the question of racism in, if I ask you in the exam, discuss, discuss the racial issue or the racial question in Bonin's short stories. Or Bonin short stories are very political, discuss. You understand? Yes, so, I want you to focus on that issue. Bonin's racial question in, the, in all her stories. You focus on only those passages, those ideas related to racism and to pale face. You understand? Yes, Doctor, I understand. If I say even, if I say discuss or Bonin's short stories are excellent example of naturalism. Discuss. I mean, you have to focus here on, on those romantic, naturalistic elements. You don't need to tell me anything about racism. You focus only on the natural implications and the natural language, the romantic language, the poetical language, in these stories. And this would be a good, a good question for you in the exam, by the way. I could ask you a question like that in the exam. Hmm? Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. I could ask you, I could ask you something like that. So here you, you should highlight only those typical, you know, uh, quotes related to this idea. Okay, so yeah, any other question?